Hello students, welcome to EPG Part Shala. I am Dr. Zinat Iqbal from Department of Pharmaceutics, Faculty of Pharmacy Jamia Hamdard. Today we are going to discuss a very important module, Introduction to Control Release Drug Delivery Systems under the paper NDDS Part 1. So students, before we start with the module discussions, let us try to find out what are our learning objectives. Before getting into the details of the controlled drug delivery systems, we would like to understand the problems which are associated with the conventional drug delivery systems. We are very much aware as pharmaceutical students that the primary requirement of a disease treatment is the availability of the drug in the blood system. For that, what we need to do, we take formulations which could be a tablet or a capsule or a pill or a suppository which releases its dosage form into the system and finally the blood has got the amount of drug which is needed for the treatment of disease. But there are certain problems which are associated with the conventional drug delivery system. We would try to deliberate those problems or limitations in this module. Later on, we would go in for the graphical explanation of conventional and controlled drug delivery systems. We would then go in for the advantages of controlled drug delivery systems. And of course, we would then discuss the disadvantages of controlled drug delivery systems. Let us try to understand. As pharmaceutical students, we are very, very sure of the fact that the oral route is usually the preferred route of systemic delivery. There are different types of advantages which are offered. The most important advantage is that being a drug delivery route which is much more convenient. The second one, it is the most natural and the safer route. Then thirdly, it is highly patient compliant. It also has an ease of administration and probably it is having a very low cost of manufacturing. And finally, it is supposedly the non-invasive route. Despite its so many advantages, there are certain limitations of these conventional dosage forms. The first conventional dosage form disadvantage is the dosing interval is relatively short. What do I mean by the word relatively short here is that in order to maintain the amount in the blood for a long duration of time, it is so important that every 3 hours, 4 hours or 6 hours, depending upon the type of the dosage form, you have to take a second dose. There is usually the presence of large peaks and valleys in the drug level which will definitely occur. Then of course, it will have a lack of patient compliance which is a very important reason for the drug therapy failure. You miss the dose once, twice and thrice and the effect is totally diluted. During the early periods of dosing, there may be insufficient drug to generate a desired biological response. Then another limitation is, for example, there are drugs with very short biological half-lives. Frequent dosing is needed to maintain relatively constant therapeutic levels of drugs. What happens then? It produces unpredictable fluctuations and sometimes it is not absorbed completely to produce sufficiently high concentrations of drug in the bloodstream and tissues. Generally speaking, the conventional system of drug delivery produces unpredictable fluctuations and sometimes are not absorbed completely to produce sufficiently high concentrations of drug in the bloodstream and tissues. Due to unpredictable or incomplete absorption, the drug shows undesirable side effects with poor efficacy. To maintain an optimum concentration of drug in plasma within its therapeutic index, it is very important to produce a drug system which makes this sure. Dosing intervals and half-life of a drug plays a major role in eliciting the therapeutic response. In most of the available conventional dosage forms, the dosing interval of the drug is relatively shorter than its plasma half-life, which results in a number of limitations. Just a while ago, we had discussed in detail the limitations of the conventional dosage forms. So all those limitations primarily lead to the conceptualization of the controlled drug delivery system. 
we are taking the oral control drug delivery system as a case here we can have two basic approaches which can be followed to overcome such situations the first one is development of new better and safer drugs with long half lives and large therapeutic indices and number 2 effective and safer use of existing drugs through concepts and techniques of control and targeted drug delivery systems we will emphasize upon the second parameter that is devising of the control drug delivery system the conceptualization of the control drug delivery systems will primarily be based on the making of a system which will have a safe and effective blood levels which are maintained for a longer period it will definitely lead to constant blood levels of the active ingredient of course it can alter the pharmacokinetics biopharmaceutics and pharmacodynamics of the pharmacologically active moieties by modifying the molecular structure and or physiological parameters related to the route of administrations in short if may just conceptualize the control drug delivery systems could either depend upon the matrix system design we can use osmotic pressure designs or we can have the reservoir system or the altered density system a control drug delivery system is generally designed to release the drug at particular rate or a specific site safe and effective plasma concentration is maintained for a time period as long as the system remains to deliver the drug the controlled delivery of drug usually results in significantly constant plasma concentration of the drug when compared to the unpredictable and uncontrolled fluctuations observed after administration of multiple doses of quick releasing conventional dosage forms to a patient in a nutshell the main objective behind the designing of control drug delivery product is to alter the pharmacokinetic biopharmaceutics and pharmacodynamic properties of therapeutically active moieties by using a novel drug delivery system or by modification of molecular structure or physiological parameters related to a selected route of administration in order to achieve all these goals there are different formulation approaches which are used what we will do is that we'll take each of these approaches subsequently the first of the approaches which we'll discuss is that of making a controlled release of formulation we have again and again emphasized that a controlled release formulation is different from what we refer to as sustained in a common language this will ensure a reproducible and a time component which will be an important factor in this in this system the delivery of the drugs in response to the time or stimuli such as ph enzyme or osmosis in this system there is a constant supply or delivery of the drug usually at a zero order rate in a continuous process for a specific period of time an amount of the drug corresponding to the eliminated by the body the animation in front of you probably reemphasize the point that how a drug is released and how it is able to maintain a constant concentration over a stipulated period of time an ideal control drug delivery system is the one which can release the drug or drugs at a predetermined rate or that is systemically or locally for a particular period of time the second approach which is quite popular is the repeat action preparation approach the word repeat in itself tells that there is some amount of repetition and in this case the repetition is that of the drug delivery it usually contains two doses and sometimes can even have three doses together the first dose of the drug initially is released immediately after oral administration that is equivalent to single dose of the conventional dosage form after a definite period of time the second single dose is released to maintain the plasma concentration some preparation contain a third dose also which is released after a certain time has elapsed following the second single dose 
it provides the convenience to patient by supplying the additional dose or doses without the requirement of re-administration. The plasma levels exhibit the same peak and valley characteristic of the conventional drug therapy. The animation right in front of you probably re-emphasizes the points which have just been highlighted. Extended release of formulations. This is again a very popular approach. The word extended in itself translates to the amount of time for which the release is extended or prolonged. These formulations are designed to overcome the problems of the conventional drug therapy as it reduces the dose frequency and also maintains a relatively constant or uniform plasma concentration. This definitely helps in avoiding the side effects associated with high drug concentration. A particular example is on your screen which is suggesting the oxycodone hydrochloride extended release tablets 40 mg strength. There are many products in the market which are based on the similar premise. The next approach which is suited for oral control drug delivery systems primarily is the delayed release preparation concept. On oral administration, the drug is released after a lag period that is after some time. The delayed action of dosage form is achieved by applying a special coat over the granules or a tablet or a capsule like enteric coating or other time barrier treatment, for example, formaldehyde treatment of hard and soft gelatin capsules. The purpose of such treatment is to reduce the side effects related to the presence of drug in the stomach to protect the drug from GI environmental degradation, which could be the acidic pH of the GI fluid, the enzymatic degradation, and other problems. The other approach, which is quite popular nowadays and is known as the smart drug delivery approach, is referred to as the site-specific targeting. The word site-specific targeting referred to targeting of a drug to a specific biological location or site of action. In such cases, the target is always adjacent to or in the diseased tissue or organ. This system delivers a specific amount of drug for an extended period of time to a targeted diseased area within the body. This helps in maintaining the required plasma or tissue drug levels in the body, thereby decreasing the risk of any damage to the healthy tissue by the drug. A smart drug delivery system usually has a goal that it does not deliver any drug on the non-specific site. A typical example is targeting of the drug sulfasalazine through a site-specific targeting tablets to the area of interest that is primarily the lower portion of colon. A receptor targeting or receptor targeted formulation. This would be one of the most idealistic controlled drug delivery system. As the name suggests, this system usually refers to targeting of a drug directly to the receptors present at the site of action. In such cases, the target should be the particular receptor for a drug within the organ or the tissue. Both site-specific and receptor targeting system satisfy the spatial feature of drug delivery and are also considered to be as control drug delivery system. Both these systems are designed to improve the bioavailability as well as the pharmacokinetic properties of a drug through various mechanisms and one which is well studied is referred to as the enhanced permeability and retention effect. These type of systems are very very valuable when you are looking for the drug delivery system suited to cancer treatment or tumor targeting. There are many companies and a large number of products which probably use this concept. My dear students, in front of you, you have a diagram which probably shows in juxtaposition the release kinetics of the two types of drug delivery systems, 
the problems associated and the need for the new drug delivery system. If we try to follow this, a conventional dosage form primarily, which is an immediate release delivery system, will release all the drug and usually yield unpredictable fluctuations in plasma drug concentrations. Juxtaposed to this, when we have the new drug delivery system called as a control delivery system, it will result not in an immediate release, but a controlled or a sustained release of drug. This primarily would be reproducible and predictable release with flat and uniform plasma drug concentration. Zero order release constitutes the drug release from the dosage form that is independent of the amount of drug in the delivery system that is a constant release rate. Control release systems generally in practicality do not attain this type of release and usually try to mimic zero order release by providing drug in a very slow first order fashion. That is, it is concentration dependent. My dear students, in front of you on the screen is a very classical plasma concentration time versus time profile, which is showing the differences between a zero order control release, a slow first order sustained release and a release from a conventional dosage form. You can see the graph lines marked clearly. We have the areas defined as the therapeutic window. The MEC is the minimum effective concentration. The MSC is the maximum safe concentration. The drug concentration beyond it will enter into the toxic level and if it is going down, it reaches the subtherapeutic level. You can see the very clearly identified peak and valley. If you just take the single dose of conventional dosage form, you see that there is no lag time and immediately the drug is released and reaches a peak concentration. After some time, it will go down in concentration and bringing it down to the valley level, which is clearly identified in the diagram shown. If we do not take a second dose, this drug will continuously go deep down, coming to the subtherapeutic level and after some time not having the relevant amount of drug in the blood plasma. In order to overcome this issue, we are asked to follow a dosage regimen, which probably we follow. And then you can see what we have a commensurate multiple peaks in case of the conventional dosage form. You can clearly identify the peaks and the valleys for each dose of a conventional drug delivery system. On the other hand, you have a clearly identifying graph line, which is showing a sustained release. You can see that the drug continues to be there above the therapeutic level for a prolonged duration of time as compared to that of the conventional dosage form. The third and the one which is of interest to us is the zero order release and that is primarily what shows in the third line indicated as the zero order control release graph. The drug continues to remain in the therapeutic window, making a flat line or a plateau system. This probably circumvents the need of taking frequent dosing and probably is one of the most important advantage leading to high level of patient compliance. Getting a little deeper into the release kinetics of the delivery systems, it is important to understand the drug release takes place on the solid-liquid interface. This primarily is governed by three major factors. The first is the flow rate of the dissolution medium towards the solid-liquid interface. This flow rate will actually govern the rate at which the drug will come into the media. The next point is the reaction rate at the solid-liquid interface and finally, the molecular diffusion of the drug molecules from the interface towards the bulk solution. It is well understood that in conventional dosage form, dosing interval is relatively short. Depending on the biological half-life of the drug, large peaks and valleys in the drug level will occur. 
the release of the drug will definitely depend on some of its own properties. The first of them is the type of the drug, its crystallinity, polymorphic form, solubility, particle size and the amount of drug present in the pharmaceutical dosage form. Dear students, by now we are able to understand what are the various concepts of the controlled drug delivery systems. There arises a question that why these controlled drug delivery systems are so popular nowadays. Of course, they must be having certain advantages. The advantages which probably are associated with controlled drug delivery systems are of myriad ranges. We have very conspicuous advantages. The first type of advantage is the major advantage and that is therapeutic advantage. The most important thing what a controlled drug delivery system does is it reduces the plasma level fluctuations which is a very very common problem with the conventional dosage forms. What it next do is it maintains a flat drug plasma level over a prolonged period of time when compared to a conventional dosage form. So an immediate release dosage form will simply go up and come down immediately in a such short duration of time. So you have to take the next dosage form while in case of the control release drug delivery system there is a flat drug plasma level. The second category of advantages are reduction in adverse side effects. I don't think we need to overemphasize this fact that one of the major challenges of the therapy is that it should not add on to the burden of the side effects. So any dosage form which is reducing the side effects would be much much more effective. So what we need to understand the advantages here is in case of making a controlled drug delivery system the drug plasma levels are maintained within a narrow therapeutic window. It probably will reduce the side effects because it is not allowing the drug to cross that window of therapy. No sharp peaks and area under curve of plasma concentration versus time curve comparable with the total AUC from multiple dosing frequencies with conventional release dosage form. The third category of advantages are related to the patient comfort and compliance. Oral route by default is the most common route of drug delivery as it is safe, easy and convenient. Reduction of the dosing frequency thus increases the patient compliance. If I need to take a tablet once a day, I will be very happy to do it. But if I need to take 5 times a day, probably I will think 100 times. And of course, that would be a non-compliance problem. The second next category of advantages are reduction in the total health care cost. My dear students, one thing is very important to understand that if there is an affordability associated with the healthcare, then only a person will be able to use this facility. Otherwise, it will probably lead to non-compliance and finally it will not deliver the health outcomes. So what is the advantages which is given by the control drug delivery system? The first important one is that the total cost of the therapy of the controlled release product should be comparable or lower than the conventional dosage form. Then the overall expenditure in the management of disease would be re drastically reduced due to reduction in the number of doses. The next category of advantage is to avoid the nighttime dosing. This is a big limitation with most of the patients. Therefore, a controlled drug delivery system, in this the patient can avoid the dose of night when they are taking a CDDS system. The other advantages which can be of much relevance to the designing is that it will definitely add on to the increased bioavailability. Because of the specific reasons, it will give us the protection from enzymatic degradation, improve the stability, maintain the uniform and constant plasma levels, reduce multiple dosing and control the release either to give a delayed, sustained or targeted release of drug as per the need of the R. We just highlighted the advantages of the controlled drug delivery system. Of course, 
there are equally number of the disadvantages which are associated with the controlled drug delivery system. The primary disadvantage is dose dumping. The word dumping in itself clarifies what it means. What we do in a controlled drug delivery system is, we relatively take large amount of drug in a controlled release system, which is rapidly released. And then finally what happens, there could be a possibility of the toxic amount of the drug which is released into the systemic circulation. The dose dumping can then lead to mortalities if the drug is potent that have a very narrow therapeutic index. So, this is one of the major disadvantage. Then we have another very important disadvantage or limitation associated with the CDDS systems that there is a very less flexibility in accurate dose adjustments. What happens in a conventional drug delivery system, we are able to adjust the dose. We simply take 10 milligrams or 100 milligrams of the drug and put into excipients, compress it, it goes into the stomach for example, disintegrates and finally releases the whole drug. But in case of a controlled drug delivery systems, the dose adjustments usually become a little difficult. Let us see why it is difficult. We usually have to have two categories of dose fractions. We first add something which is called as the loading dose and then we have to have an equivalent amount of the maintenance dose. The control release property might get lost if the control release system or the product is fractured. So all these problems lead to the less accuracy. Then there is a major disadvantage which is your in vitro in vivo correlation which is very very poor in case of the control drug delivery system. I think as students and as, stu as students of pharmaceutics we will be able to appreciate that whatever designs or methods we are using in a laboratory or in vitro condition to make a drug dosage forms, we are still not very sure whether the in vivo behavior would be superimposable or correlated. I will just take a second to just explain what I mean by in vitro and in vivo correlation. What happens is that I do the best of the formulation designing do go in for the right choice of excipients, then go in for the right methodology to make a dosage form, then go in for the pharmacopoeial standards for evaluation of the dosage form, find out that the drug is giving me an excellent zero order release over the period of 0 to 12 hours. But what happens later on when it is submitted for the in vivo evaluation, it fails what must have changed? The only change which happens in in vivo condition is its physiology which we are not able to replicate in the in vitro condition. It becomes a little more evident in case of the controlled drug delivery system. The reasons could be the rate of drug release is deliberately decreased to attain a sustained or controlled drug release for a particular duration of time. For example, let us say or in a GI tract. This area where the amount of drug had to be released can be referred to as the absorption window. Now the presence of the drug in this absorption window becomes highly significant. If there is any change hither thither, what will happen? It may give rise to unacceptable drug absorption and in vivo in spite of the excellent in vitro release kinetics is not correlated. The other disadvantage is that we cannot have any prompt termination. Once the controlled drug delivery release medication is started, it is not possible to permit prompt termination of therapy. Abrupt changes in plasma drug levels during the therapy Therapy might be encountered in case of severe ad adverse effects and of course it cannot be accommodated. Then there is another additional disadvantage that is an increased potential for first pass clearance. Hepatic clearance is a saturable process which results from biliary excretion and liver metabolism. It quantifies the drug loss during passage through liver. Hepatic clearance is a function of hepatic blood flow, degree of binding of drug with plasma proteins and the activity of hepatic enzymes and transporters.
A variation in any one of these parameters may relatively affect the hepatic clearance of a drug depending upon its hepatic extraction ratio. Then, additionally, the oral bioavailability is also associated with this hepatic extraction ratio. Greater the hepatic extraction ratio, higher will be the hepatic first pass effect and lower will be the oral bioavailability. The possibility of less drug availability for first pass metabolism is therefore greater with a controlled drug delivery system than with a conventional delivery system. Patient variation. The time span required for release of drugs from the dosage form and then absorption of drugs may vary among individuals because of the individual's physiological conditions. Co-administration of two or more drugs, presence or absence of food or nutraceuticals and the residence time of drug in the gastrointestinal tract are some of the factors which are different among patients, thus leading to the patient variability. This ultimately results in the variation in the clinical response and the degree of improvement among the patients. Ineffectiveness of the delivery system is another factor. There is always a risk of an ineffective action or maybe absence of action of drug if the drug is poorly absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. The preparation of a single dose when the drug is to be used more than one gram is really difficult to prepare. Drugs in very large quantities, maybe exceeding one gram or more, technically makes it absolutely difficult for making or converting these drugs into the controlled drug delivery systems and primarily can, are really impossible to formulate. The other factor is the avoiding of the active transport absorption. The drugs which are absorbed by active transport mechanisms are actually not suitable candidates for designing into controlled drug delivery system a very classical example is that of riboflavin. The least but not last is the economic factors. The cost of the therapy must also be taken into account since more costly polymers, excipients, processes and apparatuses or equipments are involved in the manufacturing of different types of controlled release products. As evident from this small discussion, what we understand is that the controlled drug delivery system designing is something which is the mover and shaker of the market. There are many, many products which are available in the market which are based on the premise of the controlled drug delivery. Some of the examples include the drug propanolol, which comes by the name of Inderal, Theophylline, usually available under the brand names of Gyrocaps, Theobid and Theovent, then we have the vitamin combinations under the name of NeoYCAPS, phenylpropanolamine hydrochloride, which comes under the name of Ecutrim and Dexatrim. Then we have the drug Procanamide hydrochloride, which comes as Procan SR and Pronestyl SR. And then we have variety of antitussive combinations coming by the name of Rescap or nail spensules and morphine sulfate which usually comes under the name of roxanol sustained release. Dear students, after going through this module, what we can summarize is, the first important thing which we have learnt in this module is that what are the various limitations of conventional dosage forms. Again, I would say it is so important to understand the easiest type of formulation which a formulation scientist will design is a conventional dosage form with an immediate release. Why should we go in for the trouble of making a controlled drug delivery systems? The answer is that there are certain limitations of conventional dosage forms which make the formulation non-patient compliant and therefore there is a need, a very critical need of having something called as controlled drug delivery system. We also studied in this module what are the various significant advantages and disadvantages of a controlled drug delivery system. Not only that, we also try to understand the formulation kinetics that what are the means and ways by which a drug is delivered through this CDDS system. 
we also highlighted some of the marketed preparations and supported with some of the examples of controlled drug delivery systems and try to understand that how relevant this drug delivery system is in context with patient compliance.